and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the show. Uh, today I sat down with my friend Felix. Um, I met Felix when we were working together at the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. And um, I've known Felix for a number of years. Uh, he's a really good guy, and we had a really good conversation. Um, he, he's really gone deeply into this work. He's uh, apprenticed and learned and, and done dietas very deeply in the Shipibo tradition, which we work with. Um, and he's, he's a really good ambassador and a bridge of <clears throat> really being able to express almost this other world, this world of plants uh, through his own experience of, of working and training and, and really being able to convey some things that are sometimes a bit difficult to convey. So uh, I think you guys will really like this episode. Um, we, we went into a lot of details about plant work and what it is, some of the dangers of it, uh, the benefits of it, uh, the process of training and dieting and, and singing and, and just a, a lot of things. So um, I hope you guys will enjoy it. Uh, as always, if you can go on YouTube to the Universe Within podcast page and hit the subscribe button, uh, that would really help. Like the videos, and if you can go on Apple Podcast and uh, leave a starred rating and a review, that would really help with the algorithms. Um, also with this show, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. Uh, instead of publishing the whole show, I'm going to publish like 95% of it, uh, but 5% I'm going to put on my Patreon account. So if you'd like to see the whole episode, you can go on the Patreon account. And uh, I think it's the tier for like $7 a month, which is just a little bit over a dollar an episode. Uh, you get access to, to the bonus material. So seeing the, the full interview interview. Um, I, I think the portion I'm going to put on there is really where he goes more into depths about the ikaros, the songs, and, and some of the techniques of, uh, of, of how he and the Shipibo work. So um, if you have any thoughts or questions on that, send me a message, let me know. And without further ado, here is my conversation with my friend Felix. Welcome again. Thank you. <laughs> Good to have you. It's great to be here. So I was reading a little bit on your website, and it, it's interesting because I actually don't know that much about your story, but hmm. um, I think in your website it was saying you came to plant medicine initially because of Lyme's disease. Is, yeah. that, is that right? Yeah, I contracted Lyme's disease in 2008, and uh, it was the worst disease hmm. I've ever experienced in my life. In the strangest way, it, it started to hit me as well. Uh, initially it started out as the flu and then it started to change into more of like a psychological disorder, mm. which is very strange. A lot of depression, anxiety. Um, I remember calling my mom being like, I, I think I'm going crazy. And I knew I had gotten bit by a, a deer tick. So I went and I got a test and it came back positive, which is also very rare. Um, and came back positive for Lyme's disease. For Lyme's disease. Huh. Because isn't there a lot of controversy as to whether that's even like a, a real thing? Lyme like disease? Some, yeah, some doctors seem to still think it's not real. They push it under the rug quite a bit. I actually had to go to an infectious disease specialist to figure out I had it, which was strange. I mean, because I went to my regular everyday doctor and they were like, oh, no, you just have, you know, anxiety. Here's Ritalin. Right. And I was like, no, no, it's something more. And uh, yeah, as soon as I got tested and they were like, yeah, it's Lyme disease and this is the regimen you need to be put on as far as antibiotics. Uh, I first started with amoxicillin, then doxycycline, which was just mm. horrible for the system. I didn't finish either of them. Um, it brought down the symptoms quite a bit, but there were still a lot of lagging symptoms that hung around for a while mm -hmm. um, due to, yeah. I mean, those, those, those methods work to a degree, but they only work in killing everything in the system. And the way that Lyme's disease works is it hides in different ways. So its initial... Like I said, its initial symptom can be the flu, but then later it can start manifesting as organ failure or, um, like I said, psychological disorders, uh, mm -hmm. anxiety, depression, tongue swelling, migraines, like a lot of very wow. strange symptoms. Uh, and again, I went back to my, my doctor. I was like, look, I, I have this issue with anxiety and depression. 
And she said, yeah, well, here's, uh, here's Ritalin and here's some Xanax and it'll help you relax. And, just, and all I, of that anxiety and depression started after you, you feel like you got bit. Yeah, I didn't really have, I was a pretty normal dude, smoking a lot of weed and mm-hmm. living a pretty good life. And then it hit me just like a, you know, kind of a ton of bricks out of nowhere. So the, the fact that it went from zero to that was what shocked me, especially with Lyme's disease. And a lot of people don't start equating that to Lyme's disease. Um, so yeah. And so then, <clears throat> so you started looking for alternative treatments and, and that's what brought you to plant medicine? I did. It was actually initially marijuana that helped me. Um, I didn't have an appetite for the longest period of time. It helped me calm down, uh, it helped with the body aches and pains that started to occur. And so I was actually raised Mormon. So stepping into marijuana was such a far left field. Uh, for me, but that started to open the doors into other plant medicines because I realized, oh, you know, the Mormon religion is kind of lying to me as far as this plant's going to kill me or it's going to turn me into the devil or it's going to, you know, it's super evil. It was actually the most beneficial thing I could have ever done. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then marijuana led me into psilocybin, which was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't until I took psilocybin and had my first psychedelic experience that I was like, there's something really incredible in this medicine. What what can I do to continue to pursue this, and how can I continue to pursue this? Um, it was actually through my very first uh, mushroom experience that I heard about ayahuasca, which mm. is very strange. You heard about ayahuasca through the through experience. mushrooms. Interesting. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I took mushrooms for the first time on 420, and we were all sitting inside. My friends were playing Mario Kart or something weird, or watching cartoons. I can't remember, and I couldn't take it. It was it was not similar to what I was experiencing internally. So I ended up going outside in their backyard and I laid down in a chair and I looked up at the trees and I heard, you need to go to Peru and you need to drink ayahuasca. And that was never on my map. Peru was never really on my map except for the Amazon because I loved animals. I loved the Amazon. And ayahuasca didn't make any sense to me. Uh, So I'm sitting there tripping on psilocybin mushrooms like, okay, great, what is what the fuck is this shit? (laughs) Um, So I went home and I Googled it and I spelled it very wrong. I spelled like Ayachuska or something strange. And the first thing that came up is the Temple of the Way of Light. Interesting. And that was was 2008. Right. And do you feel the the marijuana and the psilocybin, that that also helped with the the Lyme? Or it was really just opening you up to, to something else? I don't know if I fully equated it to being an aid to the limes other than taking away the body pain and giving me hunger, which is what I didn't have, or the hunger I didn't have. Um, But I could tell that after my psilocybin experience, I really felt a shift in my mental state. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take very much, I mean, as far as what I know of doses now, but um, there was a major shift. So I knew there was something in that. There was some clue there as far as what I should do to actually cure this thing. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you ended up <clears throat> at the temple and, and you, you came as a guest? Initially I came as a guest in 2013. Okay. And uh, my first experience was absolutely terrifying. It was the most terrifying experience I've had back then it, with any <laughs> psychedelic. Um, yeah, and but again, it was like, you know, thanks to the facilitators there. My facilitator was Jamie. I don't know if you remember Jamie. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. She was great. She was amazing. Mm-hmm. She encouraged me. She's like, you know what? You, you need to drink again. You need to keep doing it. I was like, okay. So I drank the second night. The second experience was the most profound experience I've ever had, um, still to this day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that was really just kind of knocking on the door as far as like what would open up for me later on throughout my life, um, especially that second experience. Uh, yeah. And so <clears throat> after you went through that workshop, there, there was some sense of, like, I, I need to keep doing this. This is, this is helping my Lyme's disease, or it's just it's opening me up to something, and I, I need to follow that. You know, my, like I said, with my Mormon upbringing, I've always had a desire for true spirituality, and I felt that was never really possible within the Mormon church. I felt that it was very limited. And it wasn't until I took ayahuasca that I had a very true spiritual experience 
that was so real and tangible to me. It was like, oh God, this is everything they're writing about. Mm-hmm. It's right here in my face. It wasn't um, proving this religion was wrong, but it's actually proving there is spirituality to me. Um, on top of that, the healing that occurred because of that, because of those experiences was absolutely incredible. I could not put my finger on what it was, but it changed my life. Um, and so after that, I was like, I want to keep learning. I finished the experience, you know, the, the workshop and I was, I was like, I really just want to keep pursuing this. I want to keep learning in whatever way that is and whatever direction that takes me. And it's funny, I look back now after facilitating workshops and people are like, oh, you know, I want to stay and I want to do this. And we're usually like, yeah, you know, that's great. You need to probably go back home and do these other things and take care of your life. And, but it was interesting. I was actually encouraged to stay. Mm -hmm. Um, and initially I had stayed to help with the permaculture program. I was working with Nick and, uh, Michal and, and then I was offered a job in center one working the door. And I was like, yeah, absolutely, I'll take that. It wasn't really a job initially. It was more of like, you're volunteering for nine months, and, mm-hmm. and then you can pursue some other job here. But it was really synchronistic, and I, I don't want to use that in a fanciful way. I want to use that in a way of like, it was just so clear that the direction was this way. I couldn't really deny it. And so I followed that. So what was that like working the door? <clears throat> so for people who don't know, uh, this work is usually done in a ceremonial space. There's, there's the, the curanderos, the doctors, often sitting in the center, singing the songs. People are sitting on the outside, drinking the medicine, receiving the songs. And then, at least where we work, there's a person at the door who kind of aids people to and from the bathroom, or maybe if they need some assistance with something. Mm-hmm. What was that like? Because I imagine that's... Actually, I mean, it seems like something very simple, but I imagine there's actually something quite profound that you learn in that, just kind of seeing all of these people going through a process. Night after night, yeah. Mm. Uh, When I first started doing the door, there was only one facilitator in there Mm. and a door person. And so the very first workshop I ever worked, I worked with Debs. So it was just Debs and I. And in that workshop, there was a very large gentleman who ended up having a very strong experience, and I had to go into restraining mode (laughs) and that was my first workshop ever and it was just again it lit me up it was like wow this is what I want to do I don't really want to restrain people but the fact that I'm here and a part of this process and I'm in this space with these people watching this experience like you can't close your eyes on the door you can't really relax it's very I had to stay alert all night long Um, so what I often did to stay alert was I drank medicine So every night I worked, I actually drank a dose. And as that process went on or as my time went on, I would drink more and more and more and be further and further in the medicine and work. And the reason behind that being is I really wanted to be able to be in this world and that world at the same time and still be able to communicate with people clearly to help them come down, to help them be grounded, um, help them to the bathroom, help them clean up their messes, in both of those spaces at the same time. Mm-hmm. And that, that experience really taught me that. And there were moments where I drank a little bit too much and it was, I was floored, mm-hmm. and, but still able to like snap out of it. I don't know what it is about the consciousness of this medicine or the, this medicine itself, but if you're in a facilitation or a working position, it has a, the, the capacity to shut itself off to a degree. Sure, you can still feel an effect, you can still have it in your system, but it comes down to a place where you can actually manage it. Mm-hmm. Why? I don't know. But it's an absolutely fascinating capacity of this medicine. Um, so what would you say, if someone hasn't worked with this, you, you use this phrase, being in both worlds. Hmm. How would you describe that to someone who's, who's never worked with ayahuasca or some other plant medicine? for a lot of people, that's very foreign. Yeah. Like, what other world is there? <laughs> in layman's terms, I would just say being in a psychedelic space or a very, very powerful psychedelic space and being grounded enough to tie my shoes and make coffee and have a full-on conversation with people. In other terms, uh, as in through this tradition, it's being more connected into the spiritual realm or the realm of spirits 
and at the same time being grounded enough in the realm of the physical um, to do physical tasks. So what is a spiritual realm? Um, the spiritual realm is about six inches off the ground, <laughs> and it's here all the time. So again, it's not another world. It's just another layer of perception. Mm-hmm. Um, so to be in those two layers of perception simultaneously to be able to work was for me what I've considered training. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like being under someone super heavy in jujitsu and being feeling like I'm drowning, but still being able to be safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, juggling these two things was super crucial for me. Um, if I didn't understand the space, the psychedelic space or this medicine space or the space of spirit, and I would go over to a guest and try and talk to them and bring them out of this space of spirit or guide them through it, and I don't understand it, how, how would I actually help them? And so it was my, my goal to actually be able to help them. And man, listening to people, as you know, in that space is very interesting. The words that come out of people, the things that they're experiencing, the places they go, um, just the word vomit that comes out of them. But those are all places they are in their lives. Those are all memories. And so to guide them through their memories back into where they are presently was key. Um, so what that secondary space is or that secondary world is, I, I don't want to go too far into the woo-woo on it, but it, it exists. And over the years, through my process of working with the Shipibo, of apprenticing and taking, taking time to diet, there's a scientific method that goes along with this. If I were to explore this world and I were to sing these songs or these words, it changes something. Okay, that worked that one time. Maybe it was just a fluke. Maybe it was my mind. Do it again. It works again. Do it again. It works again. So it's incredible that these people are actually scientists with this. They utilize this medicine as a doorway into this secondary perception. Mm-hmm. Um, as you know. So with the Lyme disease, did that, did that go away at some point or you felt like you were healed? Is it something that you still, is a part of you? I would say as of right now, 99.9% of the symptoms are gone. I have one very rare symptom that will not go away and that's tongue swelling, mm. which is the strangest thing ever. Um, I wouldn't say it was actually ayahuasca that helped to heal that. It was dieting. Mm -hmm. It was spending time ingesting other plants and fasting and purifying the system, vomiting tons, um, which was actually started to push these things out of my my blood and my system. Mm -hmm. So how did did the dieting start? Was that just a natural progression or you you felt called to, to go deeper? Dieting was really a fad at the temple when I first started. And I heard it through all the facilitators, and everyone was, oh, this person was dieting, this person was dieting, they're dieting this tree and this plant. I was like, oh, what is this fascinating world of dieting? And uh, I went and I I spoke to Francisco, and I was like, hey, you know, I'd really like to start dieting with you. And he lights up, he's like, yeah, see, of course. And uh, so it kind of was a natural progression, but it was also kind of like pushed upon us at the temple initially when I first started there. It was like it was a natural progression of being a facilitator there is having a certain number of diets to actually be able to hold the space, uh, to stay safe in that space in some way. Um, but yeah, I, I started to speak to Francisco and that's when I started dieting. And, and that for me was just, that was the answer. Hmm. Wasn't, wasn't ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is great, but dieting is really the answer. So what I know of Francisco, I've worked with him a few times, but it's interesting because probably a lot of people don't know this, but for example, Francisco, he's, he's very religious. He's very Christian. Mm-hmm. And, and actually a lot of Shipibo are, a lot of the Curanderos are. I mean, I might even say the ones that I know who, in my view, are the best are actually religious. probably some of the most <laughs> religious <laughs> also. How do you think that that fits in? Is is it something they've kind of blended and, and taken into their own tradition, mm. or uh, like how do you how do you see the, the balance of, of how they're they're looking at at their work through their own lens and mm. then also through this lens of Christianity? Well, I asked Francisco about this actually because I had the same question. Uh, initially, leaving the church, I had a major aversion to religion, mm-hmm. 
And so it was very challenging to start working with this maestro who was very religious, but I guess that's, that was a part of my, my journey. But I asked him, I said, well, you know, why do you like the Bible? And he says, well, you know, the Bible has a lot of light, but it also has a lot of darkness. He's like, it's just like a plant. It has truth. And I said, well, what do you think of Jesus Christ? And he goes, well, Jesus Christ was a moraya, obviously. <laughs> um, and for those of you who don't know what a moraya is, a moraya is the highest level healer in this tradition. Um, I love the, the translation of moraya. It's one who is sought and found. Mm. And so they just say, yeah, Jesus was a moraya. My, you know, my grandfather was a moraya. He did the same thing. Mm. He had the same task to do. He went out and he healed people. He taught people. He lived a good life. This is Wananya. This is Muraya. So they just see it as a book that kind of explains, you know, what this path is. They don't see it as like a, we need to pray to Jesus as he is the highest God. They're like, well, we know this Muraya Jesus now, and we'll call him into the space. Uh, Francisco actually used to sing songs about Jesus in ceremony. And I remember it would trigger a lot of people because they're like, why, why are they bringing religion into this? And it's like, well, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily religion. It's the fact that this being had achieved something very high and through that was able to heal people, was able to teach people and was able to change and disappear or defeat death, whatever you want to call it. Um, and there's Morayos who have done that in their tradition. They talk about those stories. So they don't see a separation in that religion and spirituality as we do. I mean, not we don't do that, but they don't see religion as I'm going to go to church, I'm going to pray to God on Sunday. It's I see this man who's an example of, you know, a being I want to be like, and I'm going to follow that. Mm -hmm. And he has a lot of light. They call their grandfathers in ceremony. They do the same. You know, they call upon their, their Muraya ancestors. So, yeah, through... Through Francisco, it actually gave me a better appreciation of not necessarily religion, but spirituality and Christianity in that in that sphere. Mm-hmm. Um, am I Christian? No. Is he Christian? No. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's interesting because in their village, you know, Francisco is is called a, a demon mm-hmm. by the religions or by the people who are religious. Um, my other teacher, Sui, Sui's same thing. His sister is religious. She's Christian, but she calls him a demon. She says he's going to hell almost every day. And he's like, well, he's like, well, I fight demons. I clean demons off of people. So I guess, uh, I guess she's wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's another big thing. I think probably a lot of people don't realize from the outside is that there's, there's still a lot of, I mean, I would imagine some is still a certain racism, uh, a certain classism, but also a very religious fundamentalism of of anything that's outside of Christianity is is demonic work. I mean, that's that's where even this word brujo comes from. Is it's well, you're a demon, you're a you're a witch, you're a warlock. Um, but it's interesting because even with the shpibo, that's also part of their culture, right, is, mm-hmm. is, is this idea of someone else is a brujo. <laughs> so do you have any insight on that, like where, where maybe that also comes from within the Shipibo culture? Well, um, I mean, in Shipibo, they call it shitanero. Uh, shitana is, is brujeria, is black magic. And the shitanero is somebody who came to the plants for power, and that's it. And that whole path of brujeria, shitaneros, is a path that is filled with desire, almost like a sexual desire towards power. <clears throat> and so within their tradition, I mean, this has been, this is a very interesting topic. I hate to say this, but through my experience, through my understanding, and through what I've been told by a lot of Shipibo, there are very few unanya, there are very few curanderos. Mm-hmm. Like a very, 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 very small number. The rest are brujos. And then there's like some in between that are half good, half bad. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I've experienced this. And this is why I actually find this tradition, this path, this medicine extremely dangerous. Um, if you decide to go down in, in this direction as far as continuing to learn. Uh, the reason being is that the first thing that I was offered through a diet was power. It was the first thing that came to me. Through the, through the medicine? Through the medicine. Mm-hmm. It was the first thing that approached me. I said, you want money, you want power, you want wealth, you want success, you want all these things. Not that wealth and success are bad. I don't see those as bad. But when they're the core pursuit of my life and this life of, or path of knowledge, whatever you want to call it, of course that becomes evil because I become lost in this very closed loop. And so I go to, I go to my teacher and I say, hey, you know, Francisco, I, this, this plant was trying to give me this thing. And he goes, oh, what'd you do? <laughs> I, was, uh, I, didn't, I said no to it. He says, oh, good. Mm-hmm. That's a prueba. That's a test. And he says to me, now that you face that, he says, oh, you know, every time a plant comes to you with power, anytime the plant offers you something magical, powerful, beautiful, be careful. Ask about it. Is this for medicine? Is this for wisdom? Or is this for power? Mm-hmm. Can I hurt somebody with this? Or can I help somebody with this? This is like very, very early stage for me. And, and I found that to be extremely true now when I went to go work in the Shipibo village with Sui and his family we had another young apprentice who was there and this young apprentice loved power and he found it in every single plant that he could get and he never said no to it and he was never told to say no to it and over time it actually made him crazy mm. where he started to attack his family he started to, to attack his, his uh, teachers he started to attack his own self. And so they had to bring him into a ceremony alone with four other maestros to cure his brain of the shitanero. Mm-hmm. They call it the yushin. The yushin is just a bad spirit. It's the bad mind. Mm-hmm. And so in this, going back to this question that you asked, this, this shitanero has always been there. It's just a part of nature. I don't think that we can ever have a plant or a part of nature that is all light or that's perfected beauty. Um, I don't think there's unanyas that are all perfect. Even if they are very, very good people, they're still human. Mm. They still make mistakes. And so the shitanero is just someone who didn't care about what direction they went or what they did to other people or what means they did to do that to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question fully. Yeah. yeah. I mean, would you say, in a way, isn't that just kind of the, the nature of humanity? Is, is, is a lot of these medicines, they, they, they bring up these, these latent things that are inside all of us. And, I mean, it, <clears throat> if you think about anything, you know, politics or sports, I mean, there, it seems like probably most people enter that with good intentions, mm-hmm. but then there's this seductive aspect, the, the, the power, the fame, the glory. And it's very easy to become overcome by those. Mm-hmm. And it, it takes a very strong person, a very principled person to, 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 to constantly come back to center and mm-hmm. to say, no, I won't go down this road. Because for me, that that's often a, <clears throat> I think maybe a lot of the confusion around this word brujo is like, there's people out there who go to a, a school of brujos because, you know, they just, they, they, they want the power. And, but from, from my experience and my understanding, it, nobody starts that way. Everybody starts with good intentions, but it's very easy to become seduced by these qualities and not just in this world in in, in any, any world, any world. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I think also, you know, a lot of people come, they hear about dieting and they think, oh, it's going to help heal me. And absolutely it will. But as it starts to remove things, we start to uncover more and more of our traumas, our bad mindsets, our desires, or whatever they are. And it's then when we start facing ourselves in those places that we actually have that choice to change between, okay, I'm going to transmute this or change this, change my old patterns and be something better. Or, oh yeah, I forgot I really liked those things. And I'm going to keep feeding that. 
oh yeah, I forgot people hurt me. I'm never going to let that happen again. And these, yeah, it's, it's really, it's a choice point, but it's also dependent upon the person guiding you through these dietas to make sure that your mind does not fall into those places. Mm -hmm. Um, Initially, when I started dieting and sitting in isolation and hating myself, it was horrible. And I did everything I could to escape that space of diet. Had imaginations of being in a nice panetta bread back home, drinking coffee and eating bagels, whatever. Or I'd imagined being anywhere but that uncomfortable place. And I realized over time, without anyone telling me, thank God... So we kind of hinted at it, but I was just avoiding myself. Like I just kept running away to these places of cushy comfort that weren't real. And so I was doing this self brujeria, this black magic to myself, this self delusion of pushing myself outside of my comfort or my discomfort into this place of imaginary comfort. And it took time to just shut that up, to tell it to stop to really ignore that, um, to just get the mind to shut up, to just stop, stop pulling in what direction or the other. didn't matter if it was towards the light or towards the darkness. Mm. didn't matter. And I think through this process, yeah, of course, it's going to uncover these, these latent patterns um, of power, hungriness, or you know, desire for wealth or whatever they are. But again, it's, a, it's up to us to purify those. It's up for us to, to change those. It's up, up to us to defeat the Yushin inside, the bad spirit inside that wants us to follow down these roads. Mm-hmm. So I can see, again, this kind of ties back into the religious aspect of it because you have the God and the devil, you know, the, the one who's tempting you into darkness or whatever. And then you have God trying to, well, God doesn't really do anything. He just sits there and waits for you to cho- make your own choices. But it, it's, it is actually mirrored in reality. And maybe not even in this world, I would say in our daily life, you have this opportunity, you see a wallet on the ground, you pick it up, there's tons of money inside. Do I give it back to the person or do I keep that money? Mm. Hmm. I might keep that money. So this is what I, I referred to earlier on too with the scientific method of this, this whole process. It actually holds true in a lot of places without, without me putting my own opinion on it first. I tried to continually distill my mental perceptions of what I thought this path was, what I thought I was, what I thought plants were, until it was nothing, hopefully. I'm not saying I'm perfect at that. So I could see what it wanted to show me, Mm -hmm. what nature wanted to show me, whatever that was. And these are the places that brought me to the things that they talk about, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. So was I being influenced through that whole process? I don't know. Um, do you think that's where, I mean, you, you, you alluded to that having, having a good teacher or or a guide is so important because I have seen people who've been working with these plants for a long time, mm -hmm. 10 years, 15 years. And yet it seems like potentially they're still at this certain level and, I think the natural train of thought is maybe the more I work with these plants, the the, the higher I get. Mm-hmm. But do you think that's where a guide is really important? Because we can get lost in, as you said, you know, these, these other things, the, the seduction, the power. And it, at least for me, I, I think that's where the role of a, a really good guide is so important, which is to, to help you to regulate that. You know, for example, if my ego starts getting really big, Maybe, maybe, maybe Here's the person cup. gives me a, a bigger cup and, and that will almost assuredly <laughs> bring, you back bring, bring that back down. Um, but if we don't have that, it, I think it can be very easy to stay at this kind of certain level, this, this surface level. I, I was talking to Claude, actually, I just remembered this and he was saying a certain thing that, that, you know, many people, even in this work, it's very easy to stay at this kind of surface level hmm. of, you know, oh, everything's love and light and beauty and I'm so great and everything I think is true and da 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 da. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. That's a huge can of worms. Uh, especially being here in the valley, the sacred valley. I don't know if you know every other person and their grandmother is a mm-hmm. service medicine here. Um, not 
as a negative judgment towards that, but as an awareness that a lot of those people have taken medicine and then were told through the medicine that they're now maestros and they go off to serve medicine. And people usually get hurt or go crazy. Mm -hmm. In any kind of psychedelic space, hopefully you have some sort of guide. In any kind of space that is non-material, hopefully you have somebody who's been there before. Uh, once you start entering those spaces, it is a whole new world. Sure, there are similar things, like you can still recognize a table and a plant, but you don't know their function there. They have completely different functions in that world. And through, through my process, I'm so grateful to have had good teachers who have been there every step of the way and who have put me on my knees over and over and over again, calling me dumbass and cabeza duro or mapo chorish, because I, I think I know something mm. when I don't. It didn't matter how long or how far along I went, I never really learned something that I thought was this grand truth that I can share with the universe, whatever stupid thing I was looking for. But I learned things about myself that were very grounded, that were very clean, that were very pure, like learning patience, like learning um, compassion, like learning faith. Super simple things. Mm -hmm. But they were hit me in such profound places. God, the first time I started dieting, too, I was like, hey, you know, like, when am I going to start singing? Am I going to start singing Ikaro soon? You know, like, are they just going to come out? My sister just looked at me. He's like, patience. The first time I went to Sui and I said, Sui, I'd like to apprentice with you. He looked at me and went, ha, and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> he laughed in my face. And I appreciated that because I came again with these, these huge imaginations that can come through medicine and not with a reality or a, a real understanding of what I was looking for or what I needed. Um, and as we start going deeper and deeper into this world of dieting, of learning, of growing on this path of spirituality, of, of plant medicine, of whatever, you're going to encounter bigger and bigger and bigger things. Mm -hmm. um, bigger spirits, bigger energies coming out of people, um, whatever. And if you do not know what you're doing, you can get killed. You can get people in your ceremonies killed. Um, yeah, you can get severely injured. You can go crazy. And so to have somebody there who has been there before is so perfect. Sui does not teach, or my teacher does not teach by saying, okay, eventually you're going to encounter this thing. And when you get there, this is what you should do, X, Y, and Z, and that will get rid of it. What usually happened is I stumbled into it by myself, got hurt, got messed up, whatever, almost lost my mind. And then he tells me, oh, you just encountered this. Good job. Now you know what that's like. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's beneficial for people just to go out and trial and error things, go out and take psychedelics and see what you can encounter. I'm saying it's super beneficial to have somebody there that can catch you when you fall, when you fall hard. My teacher who's been practicing this, Sui, who's been practicing this since he was 14, has a teacher who watches him. And vice versa. Francisco has somebody who watches him. They all have these checks and balances as far as like what they encounter. If it's too big, they go to their uncle. They go to their grandfather. Mm -hmm. Hey, I need your help. This thing is big. And to think I have any kind of capacity to face these huge things alone or to walk this path without having any kind of teacher is the most arrogant thought I could have ever had. Um, so I'm grateful that they were there to slap me out of that. Mm -hmm. And it's essential. I think it's absolutely essential. You can't learn about the spirit world without having somebody who knows the spirit world. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to get to Cusco unless I've been on that road to Cusco before or somebody knows that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's but a it, big thing. I mean, I think there's, I think anyone who's really begun to go deeper into this work I think that's a really common thing which mm -hmm. is this realization that I can't do this alone mm -hmm. you know that at some point we have to ask for help absolutely because the thing can be so so big that literally what do I do and even just having someone there who assures you or myself 
can be huge. Absolutely. The most terrifying thing that ever happened to me, though, was when I was in a ceremony, just a very small ceremony with my teacher, and he encountered something he didn't know. Mm. That was terrifying. And it was just us. So would you also say, to some degree, like, we can only provide for people what we know, what we've done ourselves? To a degree. uh, There also is the aspect of the plants that you have dieted that have the wisdom to actually take care of this thing. Mm -hmm. Hopefully in that moment when we are faced with something that is so colossal that we do not know what to do, we can humble ourselves and clear ourselves enough to let something else step forward to help us take care of that. Mm -hmm. And that's what the dieting process I think is really about is just cleaning all the shit off the mirror so whatever needs to come through can come through. Mm -hmm. And it's like, um, yeah, you know, I watch... I've watched Francisco encounter huge, huge things. And he stops, and he starts to sing to a certain thing. There's one tree that he has. And as soon as he does, you feel the energy shift immediately. Something else steps forward. It's not him. None of these maestros are actually doing anything for you. It's all these spirits, all these plants that they've dieted that actually come forward and do something for you. Um, And that kind of goes back to the first thing we were talking about, about brujeria is like, the brujo thinks he's doing it. Mm. <laughs> you can't do anything in that realm. You can make sounds out of your mouth. You can say prayers. But what are you actually doing when you're making sounds out of your mouth? Are you calling upon a bigger spirit? Or are you saying, I'm going to clean this thing off your brain? There's a very big difference. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, I, and I, I agree with Claude when he says that you can only go so far by yourself. You can only go so far with certain maestros. I am a, I'm a Westerner who's come into an indigenous tradition. I'm a white dude from Southern Maryland. And I've come into a tradition thinking I can learn something. <clears throat> 90% of the maestros I've met has said, you can't. There's no way. Or they'll say, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can diet. But you won't get there. A lot of these people don't actually want you to enter the realm of Unanya or the realm of Curandero or whatever it is. Very few actually do. Um, And that's another challenging thing because everyone, this dieting topic is such a hot topic in the medicine world and everyone's out there dieting with all these different people and they're all grabbing from this maestro and that maestro. Oh, this maestro has that tree. I'm going to go diet with that maestro. And as soon as you go from one teacher to another teacher from a different family, you're not going to go anywhere. You can learn things in that exchange, absolutely. You're going to learn about Bukharia, you're going to learn about envy, but you can't go anywhere. Maestros and Shabibo in particular love loyalty. And when they see there's disloyalty, they do everything to show you never to do that again. And I say this through experience, and I say this through watching people go through this over and over and over again. People who have really stepped, started walking down this path more and more. So I say that as an opinion to anyone who chooses to diet. And I say that as an opinion because I've seen it. Um, but it's, it's been my experience mm-hmm. through this entire path. What would you say is the balance? Because... <clears throat> I mean, even for the Shipibo in antiquity, from my understanding, is there would reach a point where actually uh, the curandero actually needed to go outside to, to another group, to another teacher, to actually learn that medicine, because it was different medicine. Mm-hmm. And one way I kind of think about it, and I don't know, maybe you have a different opinion, but because now you've also started practicing jiu-jitsu, and it's something I really saw in the jiu-jitsu world, too. Mm-hmm. 20, 30 years ago, you had to be fiercely loyal to your school. And if you didn't, you would be ostracized, maybe even physically beat up if you ever tried to show your face again. Because it was this idea of loyalty, like Mm. you do not go outside the system. You're a traitor, essentially. But I think something really fascinating with mixed martial arts, for example, is it's shown that that any school just by definition has its limits and Mm. it's not good or bad or right or wrong. It's just anything. It, every, everything has its limits. And with mixed martial arts now, I, I think there's a lot more openness to, 
yes, we can go outside and learn, but there can still be this loyalty to the school. And it seems to me, because sometimes people will ask me this, like, what is the best way? Mm -hmm. And I kind of think of it through that even lens of jujitsu, which is actually, like you said, if you're running around doing one class here, one class there, you're never going to learn anything Mm -hmm. because that teacher isn't going to invest in you. You know, why would they? You're, you're not giving them anything back. You're not even giving them a, a, a confidence, a loyalty. So kind of the way I see it is, is really dedicate yourself. Dedicate yourself to, to one tradition, to mm-hmm. one school. And then maybe there reaches a point where you realize, oh, okay, maybe there's something over here I can also benefit from and to, 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 to take that in also. Um, I agree with that. I do. Um I think, yeah, initially starting and dedicating yourself to one teacher, one lineage, and and seeing how far that can take you, great. When you realize that you want to start specializing in something and they don't have that specialty there, either you express that to them, your family, or your lineage, and maybe they do have somebody in the family that has that specialty, or you have to go elsewhere. But it's usually still within the ring of the family. Mm. Uh, at least within this tradition. I'm not saying personally that's what I feel would be the best option. I'm I'm more referring to like somebody jumping, you know, like you say, starting one technique with one person. Cool, I learned I learned how to shrimp by this guy. I'm going to go out and learn ar- arm lock by this other guy. Mm-hmm. And just jumping between these two people or three or four people, I don't recommend that. Um, but absolutely, I find that once you reach a certain point, and you want to go into a specialty, you want to specialize in some kind of healing, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, yeah, but there, there's a challenge in this too because the plants can do the same thing for you. Mm-hmm. It's like your, your family can have one speciality, but they know this one tree that you can diet for six months and you can learn how to set bones if you really want to learn how to set bones. But it takes this, this amount of time, and my grandfather talked to me about this. So this is what you do. So it's usually with even within that family, if you express that desire to learn this speciality, they'll say, okay, well, we have that in our family. Mm-hmm. And they'll show you the tree, they'll show you the plant, and you'll diet that plant for however long you need to diet that plant. Um, it's, it's a very challenging topic because there is, there's truth into sharing knowledge between families, but there's also so much danger in crossing the boundaries. Um, I learned this specifically through working at the temple with five different families in one room. And I'm not saying this is incorrect, but just from what I've witnessed, I've seen the challenges they have in disagreeing on how to actually help somebody. The arguments that would actually occur because they'd be like, oh, no, this person actually needs this. Oh, you're singing to this part of the person? Why would you do that? That's not what's going to heal them. You don't know what you're talking about. This is that's that's this family. That's that that's their method. That doesn't actually work. Mm-hmm. And the reason I knew this is because they pulled me aside and be like, "This family over there, they think they they think they know these things. This is what they got to do." So just to see that backbiting that actually happened during a workshop in this closed environment, and then to see it on a larger scale when I actually get guests who come through and they've dieted with this person and this person and this person and this person, they sit in front of me and I look at them, they're a mess. They don't know what's true. And that's the only reason I say that. So with delicacy, absolutely you can train between traditions or between lineages or between medicines. But at some point you're going to hit a wall by doing that. Whether that's the wall of the the one family gets really jealous and they want to stop you from doing that or the wall of these plants don't like these plants and if you mix them together you're going to get sick. Or the wall of you're now trying to train in this plant medicine like wachuma or mushrooms when you've been training in this tradition, you're going to be backwards. They're completely different symbolisms. Um, I, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, you could think about that even more in a kind of Western perspective, too. I mean, if you put five different doctors in a room, a somatic therapist, an allopathic doctor, a, a traditional Chinese doctor, an Ayurvedic doctor, there would be disagreements. <laughs> Absolutely. 
often very, very profound disagreements as to even what the illness is, what's the root of it, how to cure it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So another interesting question that, that kind of arises out of that, uh, it was interesting, actually, yesterday I saw a video from, from uh, Pasquale um, Mawa. Mm-hmm. And the, the Mawa family is, is one of the most well-known Shipibo families. A lot of people would say they're the most powerful. And a lot of them die at this particular tree, uh, Noyerao. And it was very interesting because, and I had heard this before, but he was actually saying that that tree, which is kind of the main tree that this main family works with, was actually introduced by someone from outside that family, and Hmm. actually even from a mestizo person. (laughs) So what do you think, because it's always this, this interesting question, which is what is this balance between tradition and then also change, modernity? This mm. this idea, because obviously, I mean, you like myself, uh, I think we have a lot of respect for tradition. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, for me, I think it's crazy for anyone to disregard a tradition. I mean, people don't do things for no reason. <laughs> you don't spend six months isolated, suffering, hungry, practically going insane for no reason. That's not fun. So there's obviously a reason why someone is doing that, a very profound reason. Mm. And to, to disregard that would be arrogant, stupidity. Mm-hmm. But then at the same time, things have to change. I mean, anything that, that, that needs to be alive, if something stays in a state of entropy, eventually it dies off. Mm-hmm. So, so change is not only good, it's essential. So do you have any thoughts on, on, on the balance between that, between kind of honoring a tradition, mm-hmm. but then also changing with it, growing, uh, evolving? Yeah. It's something I actually think about almost every day, uh, especially being a Westerner in a Shibibo tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, this tradition is a, is a scientific method, or it's a method of opening yourself to realms that are not typically seen on your everyday life, during your everyday life. And it works. It's super effective, and it works very well. And the methods they use to heal people work extremely well. The issue is within the communities, it's starting to die. It's starting to be ostracized. It's starting to be challenged. Um, I remember being in the village one time and talking to a family, and they were telling me the saddest thing they've ever heard was their son said he doesn't want to speak to people anymore. Mm -hmm. I was like, you don't want to speak like Shabibu. This is your blood. This is you. He's like, no, I only want to speak Spanish, Dad. I say, you're not Spanish. And for that particular father, I, he, who is an unaño or curandero, he, he said, you know, like, that is, it hurts me. He's like, that, that's, that's, that's a sign that this is dying. And so I think as nature dies in some place, it starts to grow in other places. Mm-hmm. I think through the exhaustion of the modern Western world, through the boredom of what we're being offered as far as like this is the limit of, of knowledge, or here is knowledge and this is the path you can pursue. I think people are getting bored of that and they're seeking more spiritual means, which is why we see such a large influx of Westerners into this medicine, um, into these medicines, into these traditions. I think that's just nature. You know, I, I, I think that we're breaking We're breaking the mold now as far as um, what this medicine even knew it was going to experience as well. It's it's learning, it's growing, it's evolving. Uh, Ayahuasca is intelligent. Plants are all intelligent. Nature is intelligent. So of course it's going to start finding a way to maintain this lineage of information, this, this line of wisdom. And it's not working in this direction. So she has to start putting roots elsewhere. And I think that's what's happening. I think this is why... You know, you were called down here, this is, I'm assuming, and why I was called down here in some backwards way, you know. It's, it's a part of maintaining the fire, the torch of something. But the traditional aspect of it is super crucial. It is the foundation, it is the root of the tree. It doesn't mean that we aren't, you know, the, as new branches, we're not going to uh, explore new realms of understanding in this world. But... The roots of the tree have to always be there. They're nourishing us to push us into these realms of greater understanding. 
I had an experience where a lot of my dream symbolism started coming a bit different after a certain diet. So I sit the family down and I'm like, okay, guys, like I'm starting to see these things in my dreams. And why is that? Why are they relating to me like this? These aren't the things that I was first seeing and they're not like what you see. Why is that? I said, well, you have a different ancestry. You come from a different lineage. Of course you're going to see different things. doesn't mean it's wrong. So um, they were shocked. They were actually surprised as well. It was like this experimentation of like, oh, what is this you know, Westerner seeing in his dreams? And why, is, why are these the symbols that he has versus these symbols? So I think they're becoming more aware of the this evolution that is happening, certain families, I would say, and they're accepting this evolution. Other families, not so much. Uh, I've seen literally outward hate towards this change in tradition um, or this, this influx of Westerners into this tradition. And then I've seen love where people, are, they understand. They're like, I don't, I don't own plants. Oops, I don't own nature. I can't control what nature wants. Of course they want to learn. Of course they want to heal. Look at their society. Look at their world. Um, so yeah, there is naturally there is an evolution happening, but I think we always need to fall back on that tradition. Jiu-jitsu has a core curriculum. I need that core curriculum to know jiu-jitsu. If I don't have that core curriculum, I'm not practicing jiu-jitsu. I'm practicing something else. I need that core curriculum of what the Shabibo teach, and I will always respect that and value that because that has come through how many generations of, you know, thousands of generations of trial and error, of exploration, of um, hard work and diets and fear and death. And uh, so, of course, I respect that. And I always respect that first before I say anything about who I am or what I am when I have people come, you know, it's like this is their tradition. I am now a part of this tradition through whatever means of dieting but this is first and foremost our tradition. I am just a branch of this tradition. So, yeah, to, to witness it in, in the communities is a very different thing to really even talk about it. And this is why it's so challenging. It's like throughout this whole process, I was like, you know, I, I can't do this. There's no way I can do this. There's no way they're going to let me in that door. I'm always going to sit on the front step and just wait. So I went to, I went to Sui and I was like, Sui, don't. I don't feel like you're doing anything. I don't feel like you're teaching me. I don't feel like you even care about me. Yada, yada, yada. So angry. I've been angry at him so many times. Poor guy. And, (laughs) you know, I'm there yelling at him and he's just sitting there calmly, just staring at me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He says, Pino, which is my Shibibo name. He says, you see this? There's a circle here. He says, this is Unanya. Inside the circle are all the Unanya, all the curanderos. Doesn't matter what color they are. Doesn't matter where they're from. These are all the Unanya. You see this outer ring? To get through that ring is the hardest thing you will ever do in your entire life. I can't help you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're going to get in there or you're not. It's up to you. Little did I know what that actually meant or what that means as it continues to push me out of that ring and back in, out of that ring and back in. Um, yeah. Yeah. If this is going to continue to evolve, it's going to have to keep spreading. If we're going to keep this tradition alive, it's going to have to keep spreading. That means that the color of the skin of the people holding it is going to keep changing. That means the the home root of where they're from is going to keep changing. doesn't mean the truth is ever going to change. You you told me the other day something really beautiful, Sui said, your your teacher, about kind of owning a plant. Do you remember? I can't remember exactly how, how he put it. Oh, he says, uh, you see that tree over there? Do I own that tree? Do I own all those plants over there? Are they mine? No. They're God's. God put them there. Nature put them there. How can I ever own this tradition? It's a tradition of them, the plants, not us. Their whole system of knowledge is from plants. They learned how to build houses from plants. They learned how to build boats from plants, pipes, everything. So if they 
and there's not much of this ownership as far as like outwardly, but if there's this idea of ownership on anything in this world, it's an illusion. Its root is always older than its first, the people that hold it at that moment. Yeah. One thing uh, I think I heard you say, um, you mentioned this idea of tests, that these plants mm. really test us. Would you say the, the, the longer actually someone does this work, the, the more difficult the tests become? Because I think a lot of people actually think it's the opposite. <laughs> that the more you do this work, the easier it gets. <laughs> that maybe the, the smaller the tests become. No, they, they get bigger and bigger. And they don't stop. This, is a, this is, goes back to talking to Francisco. And Francisco's in his late 60s. He's been working with plants for, God, three times the age of myself. <clears throat> but uh, they get harder and harder. And I said to him, like... Do these, do these ever stop? Like in the middle of a test, I'm like, I look over and I'm like, Francisco, like, do these stop at any point? And he goes, no, no para. They don't stop. But the joy always keeps coming afterwards. The wisdom always comes afterwards. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. But they don't stop. I never thought I would be on a path that tries to kill me over and over again. But it does. <laughs> I mean, that's a really interesting topic. I mean, that was something I was talking to, to Alan about. Mm. Um, I mean, even ayahuasca, the, the, the Quechua translation of that is vine of the dead. Mm. Um, and, and if you look at shamanic traditions all over the world, they would say the same thing. This is a path of suffering. It's actually a path of dying. My main teacher says the same thing. It's a path of dying many times. And each one of those actually becomes more challenging. You know, there's, there's surface levels where we're like, oh, that's really beautiful. That's, <laughs> I stay on after or something. But then that becomes more and more real. And, and I think that's very hard for a lot of people to realize. Uh, you know, it's something I, I, I would hear a lot working at the temple is, ah, you know, I don't have any fears or I'm not afraid of dying. I mean, for me, as long as we still think that we exist separate from everything, there's a tremendous fear. <laughs> and to actually go into that that state of everything dissolves, it's the scariest thing. You know, you, we can't even imagine it. Mm-hmm. You, you can't even put it into words. Why, why do you think that's such a, a fundamental aspect of any shamanic path is this idea of dying? ayahuasca vine of the dead because for most people they're like why the f would i want (laughs) to work with the plant that's called vine of the dead that's often something that's kind of glossed over Mm. you know people just push that aside well i don't know why it's called that it's all love and light and you know (laughs) see angels and 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 there is that there is that but why do you think that aspect of death is is actually so critical Well, my first answer would be it weeds out any kind of false sense of anything, a false sense of ideas or false sense of pride or imaginations. or It weeds out anything that's false. Death is the great equalizer. It will bring whatever image has been built up and it will bring it to the dust over and over and over again. And that is terrifying even if you continue this path, even if you keep drinking plants and you have tons of diets and you're, you're strong, you can go into ceremony, you can do things, great. When you die, what do you have? That idea is gone. All that's gone. I just think of like a special forces training. And they're like 90, what is it, 70% of the people that go into special forces training wash out. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. They're facing death, but in a very different way, Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not in special forces. Um, well, uh, that's something else probably a lot of people don't know is, is a lot of people die in that training. They, they literally die. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of people die in this training, mm-hmm. which people don't know. I didn't know that until I almost got killed. And I went over and I talked to the nephew. And I said, you know, I almost died, right? And he goes, yeah, man, did you know this path can kill you? <laughs> I said, no, nobody told me that. <laughs> but 
I think you're you're, you're scaring all of our audience. Away. No, and, and and I don't and I don't. I want to be be sure I'm super clear in this. This is after deciding inwardly and outwardly that I want to pursue this path of apprenticeship. And is that a really important distinction too? Is what the intention is? That is an important distinction. I remember when when I first declared this. I declared this at the temple, and so did Ben. Uh, did you meet mm-hmm. Ben? Yeah. We both declared this openly and outwardly, and immediately we were attacked on different layers. Firstly, by people who we knew who were like, "There's, there's no way you can do this, man." Remember what we tell the guests? You, know, you have to make sure you keep telling people you can't do this. You know, like if a guest, for example, if a guest says, "I'm going to be a muraya in a week," or "I'm going to be a shaman," mm-hmm. we have to be like, "Understand that this is what it takes," or you know, we have to. Bring them back to the reality of the situation. Well, not you've had perspective too, right? You not that you've had seven ceremonies and now you're a shaman. That, that doesn't happen ever. Not even in the tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, there's a very big distinction between these these two paths. And in fact, your visions that you have when you're just drinking medicine to be healed are very different than the visions you'll have as you start to apprentice. The first three years of my apprenticeship, I had no visions whatsoever. It was a black wall. And that was right after I said, I want to apprentice. I had nothing. I had very short glimpses, little flashes of things. Um, But when I first drank ayahuasca, they were the craziest, most incredibly beautiful visions I could have ever seen. So the medicine knows the difference between you're here to heal and you're here to be treated by this medicine and it can help you just in incredible ways. When you change that and you say, I want to learn and I want to grow in this path, immediately nature responds or the plants respond and they're like, okay, Mm -hmm. now we're going to beat you up. We're going to put you in the crucible. We're going to burn you. Um, And not even to scare you from that. But I, I don't think there's a reality... From what I've heard through all these other groups of dieters and people who've talked about these really, they've had three diets and they've had really beautiful experiences and that's, that's great. That's, that's a part of the reality. There are incredible experiences that come through dieting. But keep going because you have to hit the darkness. Um, there's a really powerful image I've seen. There's two paths and it's this painting. There's two paths. There's this path that's walks through this dark brambled road and it goes down into this dark, dark area. And there's this really pretty path with light and it goes up the mountain and it looks really good. And this philosopher asks, he said, well, what's the right path? Shouldn't we all be aiming towards the light? And I, you know, I, I thought that too. I wanted to just aim towards the light. I wanted to be all rainbows and unicorns. I thought, man, I thought, when I first started this, I thought I might meet some guru in the jungle who would teach me the great mastery of how to be myself and how to be perfect and all this nonsense and learn to do all kinds of cool magic. Whatever imagination that was, it got destroyed very quickly when I actually started to diet and die. And that's why that death was so important. I just kept dying. I don't, I don't know. I didn't know what I really wanted my initial impression of what I wanted was something that was built up over the years of memories of these ideas of what I thought this was, what I thought knowledge was, what I thought the medicine was, and that had to die. And shit, it keeps dying. It hasn't stopped. There's no end to this path. There's no, you've reached a certain point, good job. Here's your sweater and here's your little button and you're this title and this is you. You're just going to keep walking and you can't turn back. And that's what I love about it. We have a really good friend that comes out to diet with us at Matsanate. That's the diet center we, we go to. Uh, and we both came up with, with, this, with this slogan for the diet center and it says, we're always a white belt. Every time we walk into that diet center, we, we're white belts. So actually on the sign over the center, it's called Matsanate, always a white belt. There's always a white belt in 10 different languages on that, that sign. Hmm. And I remember that every time I sit down to diet, I don't know shit. Excuse me. I don't know anything. And if I don't, if I approach the plants every single time, like, I, well, I have this set of knowledge here that I can use for this part, it won't work. So every diet should be a diet of death. 
I remember several years ago, I'm like, wow, you know, I've been drinking a lot of medicine. You know, I'm, I'm getting to a place. I'm singing. I'm doing things in, in the medicine space. Wow, it's really cool. This guy came into town in, in, in Pizak here, and he's, he's like, I'm, I'm offering bufo. Uh, I said, okay, cool. So I went and I smoked bufo. Bufo kills you immediately. There is nothing to hold on to. And I started grasping at that idea. But, but, but I thought I knew. I thought I, oh. And to see that come up again, I'm like, God, is there any end to death? And I think in our comfortable modern lives, at least for me, in my comfortable modern life back home, I didn't really address death as this thing that was right next to me all the time. I addressed death as... Well, I'll get to about 60 or 70, you know, have had a good life. Maybe I'll have some property and then I'll pass in whatever way that is. And it's there. It's way over there in that future. But death is sitting on my shoulder. And when we have that realization, especially even in ceremony, in ayahuasca ceremonies, we have that realization. We see death. We die. We realize, oh, my God, it's that much closer. I need to change something in my life. If I didn't know death was stalking me literally, I wouldn't change anything. I would be like, well, I can change it next year, the year after, or some, sometime down the road. But when death is right behind me, I have to keep changing. Mm-hmm. Do you think there, kind of as you were saying, there, there, there's a lot of these, these, these ideas or these beliefs we have. And I think a really common one is, yeah, the, the more I do this work, the more I'm going to get, the, the, the more tools I have or the more I learn or the more I know or the and yet with that idea of death there's almost a stripping away and and actually it, it leaves us more and more we use these words in the beginning with these very simple things like groundedness uh, humility patience uh, would you say actually that's where the real power lies in is is these very simple kind of fundamental things that we're somehow left with when we go through that dying experience? Well, I mean, I think they're the fundamental building blocks of being. And I think that we've, we've moved as a race so far beyond the fundamental building blocks of being human that we've, lo- we've become ill in that, in that space of like com- overcomplicating it. You know, if I have a good job, if I have, you know, at least six figures in my bank account, if I have these ideas of a nice car and a good family and and everyone's happy and we're all learning, we have these educations, blah, 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 blah. There's all these other, that's, that's great. Those are great branches of the foundation of the roots, which is how to be actually a good human being. And I'd rather learn how to be a good human being than learn how to turn somebody's brain inside out with my mind. What does that do? What does that do? This is why this, this path of dieting has these, you know, these two little avenues of like the brujo or the black magician and the unaño, the curandero. It's like you, you see, wow, I look at this person, I see they have all these thoughts. I see they want to be, they think they're this thing. And I see that they, they want to keep pushing forward into that realm. Well... I can reverse that and make them go back to just being a good person, being nice, being helpful, being humble, uh, being patient. Or I can keep showing them how to expand on that imagination. And for me, I'm, I'm very grateful that I've had teachers that didn't let me get too big in my britches as far as thinking I was something. Every time I thought I was something, they really... Just made me feel like shit in a great way. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Those, those little, little truths are so big in the end. I remember in one diet, this was a very long diet. In the whole diet, I was frustrated. I was so annoyed. Again, poor Sui. I'm not learning anything. I'm not learning any cool things. I don't know how to do this or do this other magical thing or like call upon these animals to come help me. What is this? Like, what is this bullshit? You know, so angry. And I had this dream in the diet 
and I'm running around, I'm running everywhere in the dream, I'm taking a, a four-wheeler and I'm driving all over town, and as I'm driving, I'm slowing down a bit, and then I end up at, a, at an ashram, and I walk inside and there's a big cartoon Buddha standing in front of me. I go, oh, the first lesson's patience. And he smiles and he does a little jig and then I wake up. Mm -hmm. I'm not a patient person. I'm still learning that lesson. But I'm grateful that that keeps coming up. This is also why I do jujitsu. If I wasn't patient and sitting under somebody who's crushing me, would I be able to eventually submit them? And it keeps coming back. It's not like, oh, you, you've, you've got this little nugget of truth and that's now your badge. It's, oh, there's a little seed planted. You better learn how to use it. Mm-hmm. Man, I still don't know. <laughs> it's funny that Unanya are called one who knows. I don't know anything. Why do they call me Unanya? I don't know. Is there anything to know? Mm-hmm. I had a buddy, and he <clears throat> he he was a boxer. Uh, he was he was going pro, and and then in the end, he didn't. Uh, but he said to me one time, he goes, "You know, I, the, the reason I like boxing is because it dumbs me down." <laughs> And that's so counterintuitive to so many people. Like that, that's the opposite of what you'd want. We, we want more knowledge. We want more, more, more. And uh, I actually saw an interview, I think it was two days ago, with the, the oldest man in, in the United States now. Mm. He's 111. And they asked him what his secret was. Or I think they asked his, his daughters first. And they said, well, he just never gets stressed. He's just very, very patient, takes things easy. And then they asked him, and they said, you know, what's, what's your secret or what's important to you? And he just said two things. Uh, he said, um, to serve God and to be nice to people. And that was it. And it seems, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but it, I mean, it seems that's, that's very much a kind of this nature of our time. I mean... We look out in the world, I mean, look at what's happening in the U.S., but I mean, really all over, and there's this very deep division, and it seems to me like a lot of that comes from this very strong mind. I am right. And if I am right, no matter what you think or believe, that means someone else is wrong, mm-hmm. and it creates a division, you know, and, and I think one of the fundamental aspects of, of spirituality is this idea of union, of, of coming together. And if I'm right and I make someone else wrong, it creates a division and it also puts me on a higher level. Mm. I'm saying I know more than someone, therefore I'm better than this person. And that, that's all, I mean, that, that essentially is war. That's what all war is, is I'm right and you're wrong. And eventually, if if I'm right enough and I'm justified enough, I can kill you because I'm right. (laughs) And it seems like some of these fundamental ideas, you know, being nice to someone, being patient, listening, understanding, maybe I don't know, maybe they are right. I mean, it seems like those are actually really fundamental things that, you know, as you were saying, I mean, not just our time, but really to any time. You know, what does it mean to be a human being? Mm-hmm. What does it mean to, to embody that? That was actually something when I interviewed Leela. She said, you know, for her, actually, the, the, the most, I don't know, she said the most, but she said this idea of what a curandero is, the word that came to her was patience. Mm-hmm. So to be a good curandero, you have to be patient. And, and that seems like maybe something we're, we're very much lacking in this time. <laughs> can I listen to someone? Can I be patient? Can I be compassionate? Can I be kind? Can I be understanding? Can I put myself in their shoes? So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, being a Westerner, <laughs> being a Westerner, working on Westerners in, in, a, in this context is a very interesting thing. When you look at somebody's mind and you see just this massive, complex, 
a room full of spider webs. And all these spider webs are little goblets of information they've picked up along the way, but they can't even walk around in their own room. And I just, I constantly see that with people where it's like they can approach another person, they can be real to a point, but then there's all these spider webs that get in the way of, I need to have this to be liked by somebody, or I need to do this to be liked by somebody, or we've complexified everything, even around just simple interactions, and we're complexifying it more by putting masks on people, by putting this background noise of, there's a virus there too, somewhere, we don't know where it is, it's somewhere, it's around, so now we need to wear a mask and a shield, and that person may be the one carrying it, or they may not. And just to see these complications that are in our minds as far as how to even approach another human being to have genuine connection are so prolific. They're just, they're stopping us from actually living and being human beings. Mm -hmm. I, I actually watched a movie recently, and I can't remember the, the name of it, but um, it's with Tim Allen, and he's this big stockbroker, and, and a, he gets caught by the IRS for fraud and basically goes broke and moves out with the Amish. <laughs> I think I saw that. Well, he goes out there and, you know, these, these big city slickers and they've got tons of money and they had, you know, Gucci and all their things that they were so in love with back home. And they lived in this very simple environment. And at one stage, the, the main Amish father goes over to Tim and he's like, um, you know, people think we're stupid. He thinks we're, they, they think we're simple. But you've just done the most complex thing in reality. You've created something. This was after Tim had planted a crop and it started to grow. And Tim was so happy. He was like, this is the greatest thing that I've ever done. Over making millions of dollars in the stock market, he found that growing a plant was the best thing he had ever done. And this simple task was actually what brought him the most joy. Mm -hmm. And he realized how separated he was from reality. All of their skills they learned in the city as far as, I don't know, making millions of dollars didn't apply when they were in a simple life. And I feel that every time I go, this is why I live here in Wadang. This is why I live in Peru. I found that my life was getting more and more complicated, more and more complex back home. And the ideas of what we should be or what we should do or what title should be behind our names or whatever nonsense we were labeling each other as or I was labeling myself as, just didn't bring me happiness or joy. It didn't matter if there was a title there or not. And I found these very, not simple as in unintelligent, but simply living people are so happy with so little, are so happy with the simplest things. And I wanna strive to be that way because I look at my Facebook and I watch people just butcher each other every day over simple words of what they believe in. And I don't find, it's war, like you said, it's just war. Mm -hmm. And it's never going to be solved because you're always going to find a counter argument to your argument. Or you're always going to find justification for your own argument. I'm not saying that information isn't valid and we can't find valid information about certain things and that can't be the truth. I'm just saying that nowadays, for some reason, information is so complex, we can hardly find the real synthesis of the truth without finding 10 million lies first. That's one reason I actually want to delete Facebook, except for posting good quotes and looking at jujitsu. So. Well, it's interesting. I mean, probably if I had to boil down why most people come to this work, through, through my experience of working with, you know, a lot of people now. And it's true, you know, most of the people coming to this work, they're, they're coming from cities. They're, they're coming from very big metropolitan areas, very seemingly progressive areas, uh, in general, fairly wealthy areas. There seems to be a real disconnect in, in terms of a purpose and a happiness. And, and if I had to boil it down, that's probably the things that, that I see the most of, is just, I don't know why I'm here and I'm not really happy. 
they have happiness in their lives, but they, they sense there's something missing. And some of the some of the, the, the curanderos or doctors who I also respect the most, if I ever really ask them, like, what is the point of this work? It's usually just to be happy, <laughs> to laugh. <laughs> and not that that's the experience of the medicine, but that, that as you also mentioned, that's, that's the resonance. That's what we're left with mm -hmm. after the experience. And I think for a lot of people, that's that's really hard to accept that, that maybe the point of life is just to be, or just to be happy, to be appreciative, to be grateful, mm. uh, to, to, to be in a sense of awe at times, to, to laugh, to, to experience joy, to experience connection. And yet it's so funny because often there's a resistance to that. And yet that's actually the thing that people are coming down to or, or coming down for is a sense of connection, a sense of joy. And yet if you say, well, well, that's, that's what this work is getting towards. There's almost this sense of, no, it can't be that easy. <laughs> there's all these other things. And one of the things at, at the temple where we both worked is we often separate this idea between an intention and an expectation. And many people have an expectation, which is, you know, I, I want to travel to another universe and talk to these beings, blah, 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 blah. And that may happen. But the difference between an intention and expectation is if I expect that, it may happen, but it may not. And if it doesn't, then what? But something I, I really found in my own work was, which is really well, boiling down, well, why do you want that to happen? Because that's just an experience. Mm. But let's say you receive that experience. What would that leave you with? And it's very, it's very interesting. Something I've seen a lot in my work is it's very easy for people to say what they don't want. <laughs> you know, I don't want to have this depression or I don't want to have this anxiety or I, I, I don't want to be angry at my, you know, mother for, or my partner. Okay, but what is it you want? Mm. And it's very difficult for people to say that. But I find, you know, in those moments where I'm really able to work with that person, if I keep going in, Okay, well, you want this experience, but what's at the root of that? Let's mm -hmm. say you got that. Why would that be good? What would you be left with? And often it takes a lot of work <laughs> to actually just have someone say, well, what is it that I'm actually wanting? What is it that I'm actually looking for? And in the end, it's always just peace, happiness, joy, connection. Um, so I don't know, do, do you feel like that is that is something that this work is pointing towards? It's just these very simple things that we've gotten away from. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, it's so funny watching people come to the medicine and they're like, it's like they've come to a genie. They have this idea they're going to rub a lamp and get all their wishes and have a whole new being to step into. And it's going to be intelligent and it's going to be sexy and it's going to be creative and it's going to be all these things they desire. Oops. And... It will not give you that ever because it's already there inside of you. I spoke to Alan about this actually when we were talking about dieting, but this relates to, to drinking uni as well or ayahuasca. These, these plants never give you anything. They only take things away. Diets should never give you anything. They should only take things away from you. Uni should never give you anything. It should only take things away from you. Unless it's a part of you, it's giving you back. Great. It's just you. But it should only take things away that are in the way of what you already are, these base foundation things of you. Man, when we, are kid, when we were kids, we knew exactly what we wanted. We were happy. I'm saying this as a generalization. I'm sure there are people who had very hard childhoods. For the most part, in our innocence, we were happy. We didn't have a book of knowledge that we had sitting behind our head all the time of, oh, I know all this, and I went to school for this, and we just were. And I think a lot of people, and this is why we give people that intention set of, like, what, what emotions could a five-year-old understand and seek for those? Well, if I, a five-year-old can understand joy, happiness, um, sadness, fear, why do we overcomplexify it again? Well, 
you know, I want to I want to be successful in my life. What does that mean? What is being successful? We had a gentleman or we have a gentleman who's potentially looking on on joining us um or actually who joined us before, sorry. And this gentleman was very, very successful in his life, extremely successful, like had the picture perfect life. If you look, put it on paper, it was perfect. He said he was miserable his whole life, but he had everything he wanted materialistically. He thought his kids had everything they wanted materialistically. And now at 70 or 80, he's starting to see, oh my God, I've just wasted this much time in my life. And so what he's doing now is he's actually acting like a child. He was supposed to go into work one day and he pulled over on the side of the road and read a book (laughs) in the middle of the bushes. He found this fundamental truth just not through the medicine, just through just seeing his life, just looking at his life. And this is all this stuff wants us to do. It just wants us to look at our lives and be like, wait, why is it so full of all this extra blah, blah? Mm. This extra nonsense doesn't actually help me do anything. And this is why I think in this comes up constantly is anytime somebody comes up to me and they say, I am this. Wow. Really? Can you actually be that? Whatever you are, what, what is that? And why is it hiding there? I, I'm a, you know, I, I serve this, I serve this medicine or I'm a, or I'm a this or I'm a that shit. When, excuse me. When Sui told me I'm Unanya, I got furious at him. I was like, I don't know anything. <laughs> Again, getting angry at my teacher, my poor teacher. I don't know anything, Sui. Why, why do, don't call me that. I was so mad. He was like, well, he didn't explain. He went back to singing whatever else he was singing. <laughs> he didn't want me to even sit on the idea that I'm Unanya. And <laughs> later on he goes, you know, he's sitting with his cousin, they're looking at me, and they're like, what is that? What's Unanya? Somebody who knows. What's that? What is somebody who knows? What do they know? What do you know? And I was like, I don't know. He says, well, you're going to discover. You're on this journey to discover. I was like, oh, is that the answer? Or is that the question? <laughs> So absolutely, yeah, I kind of went on a tangent there, but yeah, I, I think these really simple things are the most profound. Mm-hmm. And I think anytime we try to seek to be enlightened or guru or Buddha or whatever this nonsense is, or we get stuck in those ideas, we've completely lost the plot. Not mentally, we're not insane, but just that you have an idea of what Jesus is, or you have an idea of what Buddha is, or you have an idea of what Zoroaster or who all these enlightened beings were but you don't really know what they know or what they're actually living or how they're living. So, yeah, I, sorry, it was a big tangent. I don't know. I find that's where a lot of these, these like archetypical symbols are actually so meaningful, like the, the aurorbis, the, the snake mm-hmm. that's eating its tail. Oh, nice, yeah. <laughs> because for me, that's essentially what it's pointing towards mm-hmm. is... is everything comes to a return. Mm. And like you were saying, these qualities that we have in childhood, it often takes us to go full circle, to actually come back to something that was seemingly so simple in the beginning. I mean, the the most profound book I've probably ever read, and it was something that that kind of appeared to me when I was very young, was the Tao Te Ching. Mm. And and it just hit me. And it hit me so hard and so profoundly because it was so simple. And I just remember thinking, I've never seen such simple words. I mean, it's more simple than a children's story. (laughs) You know, it's like, in order for there to be good, there must be bad. I mean, that's mind-boggling, you know, and... And, and yet, something that, that I've seen also as I get older, I think is a lot of people dismiss that because it's so simple. Mm. Well, yeah, okay, so what? And yet, you know, for me, all of the truth actually is, is contained in that, those little pages. And I think sometimes we see this in academia and it's like, well, the, 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 
the, the bigger words that I can use or the, the more theories that I can have or the, you know, the more I can draw on these different things. You know, it's like, look at me. <laughs> I am this. You know, as you said, I am this. It becomes an identity. And all of those identities, they serve a purpose, but ultimately they create a suffering because what happens when that goes away? And that's very much like the death process, right? You know, I am a basketball player. Yeah, but then one day I get in a car crash and I lose my legs or I lose my arms. Then who am I? And I think that's where also the death experience is so powerful because that's what it is. You know, we all are going to lose all of these things, mm. whether we want to or not. At some point, they're going to go away one by one. Our health, our physicality, <laughs> eventually even our mind, this thing that we hold to be so precious, this sense of self. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very scary. I mean, for me, that's, that's the, the, the more I do this work, the more I see that's the primordial struggle is actually fear. You know, fear for me is the thing that holds us all back. Mm. And like you said, the, the more we go into this work, the deeper it takes us into that. Because you know, in a sense, it can only take us to where we're ready. Mm -hmm. Again, that's like this most simple, simple fundamental thing. The plants can only take us where we're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> if an experience happens, well, we're ready for it. How do I know? I don't. The plant, that's what it gave you. So that you must be ready for it. How could it be any other way? Mm -hmm. So it, it can never give us, it's kind of like life. Like life can never give us something we're not ready for. Mm -hmm. And yet, the deeper we want to go, the, the more challenging that, that thing becomes. Leela said that really well, you know, that this is also really a process of tests. These plants are constantly testing us. And at some point, you know, like, I think even one of her brothers, he kind of tapped out. He said, okay, that's it. Hmm. That's, that's as deep as I want to go. <laughs> it's wild. It's super common in the village, too, for people to tap out. Uh, there's a couple of young kids that come and hang out with us when they see us come to the village. I'm like, so when are you going to come even just drink medicine? No, mm -hmm. oh, man. I'm like, why? I'm afraid. You're Shapiro. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what was that, what was that process of dieting like for you? I mean, cause you, you spent quite a long time dieting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, um, like what was that like? And, and it, it do you feel like that prepared you for something? Because now, now you're working, you, you're, you're, you're living here in the sacred Valley, mm -hmm. you're, you're holding ceremonies. So what was that process like of, of entering into diets? What was that like? And then how did that emerge to eventually say, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to start working? Mm -hmm. Cause that's a big shift, you know, from, from learning, from sitting with oneself, learning from a teacher to then at some point saying, Okay, <laughs> here's Here your go. cup. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if I could put one word over the entirety of that process, it was terrifying. It was, it is terrifying. It still scares me to this day. Um, every the process time, of dieting? The process uh, of dieting. Every time I go out into the jungle there to diet with, with my teacher, it's terrifying. I'll never stop dieting. I don't care what point I reach. Um, I don't know if there's a point to reach. But um, it was such a slow process. Like I said, throughout this podcast, how many times I've been frustrated with my teacher or angry at my teacher. is just I had so many ideas of who I was going to be or what I was going to be or what I should have known or what I should know. And it just, it, they just couldn't hold water ever. And so every diet, I just had to keep getting rid of everything. And it was so frustrating because I could just, I felt like I kept coming back as a white belt every single time I went into the jungle, which I didn't like at first, of course. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to go just like jujitsu. It's hard to go into jujitsu and get beat by higher belts all the time. Like Chase just walks all over me like I'm nothing. Like I, I'm, I'm not good at jujitsu compared to him. And so the plants will do that to you. They can find every single, single corner of your mind, of your being, that just doesn't work. That is um, unhealthy. That is false. And they will rub it in your face 
um, over and over and over again. I think dieting for me was like a month long ceremony to three months to six months long ceremony. It was a ceremony that didn't have an ending and it was every day and it was in this bored place and I was uncomfortable and it was raining and there were snakes everywhere and yeah, it was horrible. Literally. Literally. <laughs> my, my, the first time I went out to go visit Sui in his village, he brought me about an hour and a half into the jungle to a little, it was just a platform of these kind of moldy wood. And they put a plastic tarp over my head. They put, uh, and actually that was it. They made a little fire in my little fire, my cooking pit, and then they left. He came back the next day with my plants. I drank my plants, then he left. Came back again, gave my plants, and left. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, so when's he going to come out and like sit down and be like, this is what you do. This is this, and this is this. This is this plant, and this is... He didn't do that. I sat out there in the jungle alone in the middle of Fukalpa and was terrified. Uh, I remember sitting on my tambo, just bawling my eyes out, just crying, like, just to the whole universe. Like, why? Why did I choose to do this? Why would I ever do this to myself? Who, who do I think I am that I think I can do this, that I can do this path? Screaming and crying and screaming and crying. It's like all I have done this whole diet is made mistakes. I'm screaming at the jungle. so. And after that wore out, the fire of that died down, I heard loud and clear like somebody was standing next to me and said, uh, first of all, there are no mistakes. And being raised Mormon, everything's a sin. I'm a sinner. I'm a terrible person. Just to hear that was one of the biggest healings I'd ever received. And I was like, oh. Okay, I'm going to sit through this a little bit, a little bit longer. I've got, you know, some more time. So I obviously kept going back. Um, and over the time, sure, these ikaros started to come through. Not As like a conscious, you can't be like, I'm going to start singing. It's actually like you feel like you're going to bubble up with laughter or you're going to bubble up with a scream kind of thing, and it just comes out. It started to happen, and every time we were in ceremony, we are in ceremony with the whole Shipibo family there. They're all sitting there. and be like, oh, yeah, okay, we know, yay. And I was just like, I don't know what's happening. What are you? <laughs> Stop clapping for me. And then they said a patient in front of me, and this was like uh, several years ago, they said a patient in front of me and they said, heal her. And they were sitting, we're all in ceremony, and they're sitting right behind me watching me. Oh, oh. You hear them like comment on things. And she know, oh yeah, okay. Pointing out things, oh yeah, we'll go over there. That was it. Um, they have certain tests that actually show that you can do something in this world in some way or another. Um, it's not that you are something, but that you can actually make a change in somebody. Uh, and once that's verified and they say, yeah, okay, it's up to our standard, they give you a, whatever. They don't give you anything. They just, they're, oh, yeah, good job. Unani huni. Great. I was like, but it was so unclimactic. I thought it was going to be a big surprise. I would get a little badge and like a kushma and all this cool stuff. I didn't get anything cool. It was just like, oh, yeah. Then they went on, smoked mampacho, and talked about other things. So, uh, Where I'm at now with this whole process is I don't ever want to think I'm anything. I don't want to get caught in that trap. And it's like uh, I'm always going to learn. <laughs> I'm never there. And I'd rather always approach this medicine, every ceremony, everything like that. Um, then be like, I actually, I know something. Mm -hmm. I don't know shit. And I'm glad to. I'm very grateful I don't. But when I sit down in ceremony and I move out of the way, when I let go of myself, when I let go of my ideas, when I let go of my mind, when these plans come forward, that's a very different thing. They know. They know incredible things. So if I can be less me, if I can get out of the way enough they come through. If I can't, they don't. Mm. It's just pinchy loco. So 
that's where I'm at now. What are some of the other tools that, that you learned through through that practice of, of, of dieting and working with Shibibo? It's Obviously, the Ikuro is very fundamental in that. Are, are there other things you learned as well that, that kind of aid you in, in, in the work you're doing? Yeah. the This is a complete system. This is something that Sui says to me very often. The system of healing is a complete system. So in the jungle where we have our pharmacy that I've learned most of, not there's so much to learn there, um, in our jungle pocket, there's a certain pharmacy. And so I know, okay, this person is experiencing extreme paranoia, fear, uh, night sweats, and these things. Okay, I know that these plants, these four plants are the best option. Whether they drink them and do a dieta is one thing. Whether they do a tratamiento or a healing uh, treatment is another thing. Whether they just do... Is that something you discovered through Sui? This is through Sui, yeah. This is actually something... This is the part that was actually shared with me Mm -hmm. later on was like we'd actually walk through the forest and be like, this is Mm -hmm. uh, Ishbingo or this is, you know. So, yeah, we're given a certain set of like these plants do certain things for certain ailments. And then we're also given these are certain plants that do certain things for your luck certain things for your love life, certain things for money, and they work. But he's like, also understand these certain things can be brujeria or black magic because you're manipulating the will of others. Don't touch them. In fact, funny story, uh, that young nephew again, we were walking around the forest, we just killed a viper, and we are walking around, we are still talking about nature and plants and stuff, and he goes, oh, actually, I want to show you something. I said, oh, okay. We go back over the Viper. He's like, there's three things here that you can use, and you can kill somebody from far away. And I was like, I don't want that. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, no, me neither. <laughs> we walk off. Two days later, I see him back at the Viper's head, and he cut it off. <laughs> so Sui so caught him and really gave him a good scolding and told him never to do that again. So within this jungle, within the jungle context, there is so many things there. There's an infinite pharmacy that can actually help people. I've learned a very small fraction of that, but that is a part of the, the learning of this thing. So how to heal people who have susto, um, miedo, fear, or shock. Uh, how to heal people who have arthritis, who have cancer. There's certain trees that cure cancer in six months. Like there's certain trees that uh, can clean asthma out of your system. It's amazing. So, yeah, as far as like an added side of the, the spectrum, of what we learned, yeah, it was definitely there as far as learning the physical plans that we can use to, to work with people. The issue is, is it's within the context of that jungle. Mm-hmm. It's within the context of those plants that they know. The next family you go over, this is kind of the thing we talked about earlier, they have a completely different set of plants that do this exact same thing. And those are the right plants or those are the wrong plants. So, yeah, that's a challenge. Um, then the other would be energetic massage. The thing I, I just haven't used it. I haven't really... I'm so cautious with touching people in a modern age, especially now. It's like there's a lot of dangers in that uh, that I don't. So even in ceremony, like I'm super careful with people. A lot of people come in because they have trauma and I do not want to re-traumatize a trauma. So I typically don't use it unless express permission is given. Um, So Safa gets a lot of nice massages, but that's about it. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. How about other things? Uh, um, A lot of people will say some of their main tools are like the the sopla or the chupa Mm. or uh, the pipe. Or are those things that you, you felt connected to? The pipe, definitely. I mean, the pipe is something that we should all have. Anyone who works with plants should have a pipe. Sorry, I can't remember the legs. Um, it's something that we do as often as possible. It's like brushing our teeth. And it's something that Sui made express. Well, he said very clearly, this is your favorite tool. This is not to me, but as working with the medicine, we should always have the pipe. We should always have mapacho. We should always have our rabodentes. But we do it like we brush our teeth. 
So we work with our pipe all the time. I've been in a lot of binds where I'm feeling super physically ill and I smoke my pipe, it's gone. Um, How that works, I can't give you the mechanics of it, but it does. I wouldn't say they're my specialty. I think certain things that I've worked on inside of ceremony are more my specialty. Uh, or something that I really focus on as far as tools, definitely my, my Icaros, uh, and especially towards like black magic and brujeria, cleaning that. The reason being is the whole, my whole path actually has been uh, me getting attacked a lot. Whether it's because I'm a Westerner trying to learn and thinking I'm, well, they call me Hosho Mashan, this white bird that flew in. Or whether it's, you know, the fact that I'm learning and people don't want me to learn, I don't know. But it's become a natural progression of learning what that is, how it works, and how to move it. So as far as specialty, I would say it's the ikaros towards that, um, what I use the most. Mm-hmm. And do you, do you think that's kind of that idea of being attacked or brujeria? Do you think a lot of that is or, like it's intentional? And, and do you think maybe some of that is unintentional too? Just, um, I mean, cause I think too, like sometimes that sounds very foreign, but mm-hmm. often I think there's ways that even we can relate to that. I mean, certainly if I'm walking down the street and I see someone and I have a bad thought to them, I mean, to some degree I could say I'm attacking them. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm I'm putting bad energy. I'm putting a bad thought or mm-hmm. things like envy or jealousy. I mean, that that has a resonance and we feel that. Mm-hmm. I mean, if there's someone who's really jealous of it, we feel that it, it doesn't feel good. Or someone is, you know, t- uh, gossiping about us that, that leaves a certain resonance. Um, so do you, th- do you think that's, that's something that's often like very specific, like targeted? Uh, or do you think some is maybe just unintentional too, where people aren't really clear? Mm. Cause one thing they, they often say is when you, when you've been working with medicine, your thoughts, your actions can become magnified. Mm. And I think, I mean, I think a lot of people experience that if you, if you work with ayahuasca in ceremony, you see that that magnifies everything that's going on. As you said, dieting a plant, we see everywhere we're, we're out of alignment, uh, do you think some could be maybe people who have also this medicine and this work, if they're not really clean in that and clear, then it can, it can begin to spill over as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not saying that's what the majority of what I've experienced. I've experienced both. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the times when you have unintentional energy like that, we call it like bumang or envidia, like envy, like you said, uh, which are the stickiest to clean especially if the person is very focused on you. Again, it's not really conscious that you're trying to hurt the person, but you're thinking not the best thoughts about them, and it puts a weight on top of them. Um, But I've experienced the other, uh, which is actually intentionally somebody trying to kick my butt in ceremony. Um, And that comes through, like, family rivalries. Like, you know, our family or, you know, Sui's family has their own set of people who don't like them. And don't want them to succeed. And because of that, I am now a part of that lineage. So I have to get involved in their little scuffles. Why? I don't know. I don't understand that. Um, so he says that that's just, that's a part of the test. Like you, you're going to always face brujeria as a part of your test. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just been so, yeah, it's infiltrated so many parts of my journey in so many different ways that I've had the opportunity to see so many aspects of it. Uh, also being a Westerner, I've seen a lot of people who have come from working with certain, I don't know, people who have done magic on them and they, or black magic on them and they come to us and they want it cleaned. And that's a whole other thing. It's like seeing somebody intentionally say, oh, look, there's a whole bunch of joy in this being in front of me. And they put it in their pocket and they walk off. Or, you know, like... Um, oh, it seems like you're actually having a, you have a good path ahead of you. Let's stop that. They cut it off. So these are like intentional things that can happen. Those are very simple examples. The more extreme examples are pretty extreme. But um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've experienced both. And they have very different flavors. Uh, over time, I started to recognize which is which. And the best way to clean them is 
to be as clear as you as you can yourself, you know, to be as centered as you can in yourself. Um, yeah, it's it's the same thing of like singing to somebody. If you sit in front of somebody and they have a very wild mind, if their mind is just running all over the place, you're going to sit in front of them and your mind's going to go just as wild. And then you're going to have to like stop your mind from going wild and then try and get their mind to do the same, mm-hmm. which is a very interesting experience. Um yeah, but Burhuri is a it's a kind of a larger subject. Um it's also kind of one of my larger conflicts with this with ayahuasca. I love I love uni, I love ayahuasca, I love this tradition, I love this path. But there is a shadow to it and I don't think it's often discussed or understood. Um so yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I I heard a, a some cases recently of, of people in hospitals where they went in, like women, and they were actually violated by their doctors. And uh, so I think, you know, sometimes it's easy to, to maybe like see the bad in, 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 in something that's outside of us. Right. But sometimes it's hard to see it even within our own systems. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, even in a more Western medical model, I mean, I think, uh, I think in the U S it's something like, I could be off in the exact number, but I think it's something like 200,000 people die every year in hospitals from doctor malpractice. Uh, it's the same. It's just a reflection, you know, they're very yeah. same. Yeah. yeah. And that's where that intention, the, the, the knowledge, the, you know, the, the training is also so important mm-hmm. because these things are powerful. I mean, they're, they're very powerful mm-hmm. and it's uh, it's very powerful medicine and uh, a lot of care has to be taken in that. It's interesting because at one time when I was at the temple, uh, it, it was at the end of a workshop and some of the guests asked Richard, I think they asked all the maestros, but Richard had the best Spanish, so he, he answered, but... Uh, they said something like, what are you doing in ceremony? And I think the, the, the response that they were thinking was, well, we're making things beautiful and something like that. But he said, we're fighting. <laughs> I think that was a little shocking for people. You know, we're fighting. Essentially, he said, we're, we're kind of like warriors. We're guerreros. We're, we're, we're fighting. We're battling. And, uh, but again, that seems to be a really common theme with shamanic work all over the world is is there's this sense of, of, of battling, which I think, again, we have very negative connotations mm. towards. But, you know, in a sense, it's, I think archetypically, too, it's, it's the battling for the light over the dark. It's, it's trying to move towards the light, and, and we have to overcome. We have to battle or overcome these, these heavier qualities, these more negative qualities, these darker qualities. And, and that takes a very strong person. It takes a, a warrior, in a mm-hmm. sense, to, to be able to, to overcome those things. Uh, because as you said, when you're working on someone, I mean, you, you've got your own stuff, but you've got their stuff that you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously the, the reason that so many people come is to overcome these, these negative things, these negative thought patterns. And, and it takes a real kind of strength and dedication and determination to overcome those. It's a very, yeah. And I appreciate you saying that the battle thing, cause that's, you know, that was my first mistake in stepping into this world it was this idea that, you know, like this idea of Gandalf or that, well, he actually battled a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, this idea of the young man going to the forest to find the hermit to learn amazing magics and you know whatever it is it's like it was a playful idea and even in my early stages of working with the medicine it was so joyous and beautiful well there was joy in there and beauty in there that I was like oh I gotta reach that place I gotta get there and that's what that's what this is about is getting to that place of joy and beauty and whatever and then it was just war. It was a lot of fight. It's a lot of fighting. It's a lot of like, wow, this demon really wants this person. How can I get it off of them? Either can I convince them off of them or can I use the power of these trees to get off of them or can I call on God to help me get it off of them? We'll have to see. But it could take anywhere from an hour to two hours of singing straight to this person until it gets away. It's a, Yeah. Yeah, and I and I, you know, I'm reflecting now, and I, I hope it doesn't sound to listeners like I, I find this path to be, 
so horrific. It's not. It's a very beautiful, very powerful path. And there's a lot of incredible things that can happen to you through this healing or these healings. It's just I don't often hear the other side of it or I haven't heard the other side of it in conversations uh, or in other podcasts where people talk about ayahuasca. They have one experience of it, one side of it. It's, it's just good to know that there's a whole, there's a very large other side as well. Um, well, isn't that kind of, I, I mean, I think all throughout history, there, there, there's been a certain maybe nobility to that profession of a shaman. I mean, it's mm. a profession, people say, you know, more and more seemingly people say, well, I want to become a shaman, but traditionally nobody wanted to become a shaman because everyone knew because they had proximity to that, that yeah. they, they, in essence, were a warrior. They, they were going into the darkness and, uh, but maybe, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking about this, but maybe, you know, as you're saying, a, a lot of, a lot of talk is just around the light and the beauty, but that could be because too, that's in, in essence, what the shaman is taking on is, mm. is doing that work because, mm. you know, even traditionally, you know, very often, unless you were apprenticing or maybe you were dealing with something really heavy, often the patient wouldn't necessarily drink. It was, mm. it was the curandero and then kind of, as you said, taking on, like entering that person and, and, and fixing, but to fix is very difficult. Like it takes, it takes that battling and, and maneuvering and cleaning and clearing and putting things back together. Mm. So for the patient, what they emerge with hopefully is love and light and beauty and peace and joy. Uh, but for the person working, it can be a real struggle. Absolutely. When I, <clears throat> when I first started working, I remember calling my, calling Sui at one point being like, Sui, I'm in a bad place. Like I just pulled this thing off this person. It was really big and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> He says, Pino, did you, did you smoke your pipe? Uh, no. Go smoke your pipe. He said, and then right before I got off the phone, he was just going to hang up on me. I was like, wait. <laughs> I was like, what, what else? And he's like, man, this work is 24-7. It is all the time. You don't get a break. This was in between one workshop to my next workshop. I was like, well, what, what, what do you mean? Like, I mean, I got to get some rest. He's like, no, you're always in this world now we're always facing things and and whether it's cleaning a demon out of somebody or facing my own fear or facing my own doubt or facing my own angers or whatever i'm still fighting against something i'm still trying to dominate something um jocko willick is that his name Mm -hmm. the navy seal he said i'm at a constant battle against weakness and i loved that that was it was so essential for me to hear that because it's true i mean the old me wants to come back and whine and curl up in a ball. I just want to like sit and watch Netflix and be normal or whatever. I don't, not normal, but not feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and I can't because I'm, I want to go back into this weak state. I want to give up and I can't. And this is why I am pursuing jujitsu as well is I'm finding more weakness in there as well. And I want to keep defeating that. I want to get better at that. I want to get uncomfortable. Shoot. Last last week when we rolled, man, I was exhausted and I tapped out. I don't like that. I want to get better. So it was a good lesson to be like, okay, there's my limit. I found something. Mm-hmm. And I'd rather beat that and roll with you next time and be exhausted and still just keep going. Whether I get tapped out or not, I don't care. But it's always there. It's always confronting me, these aspects of my weakness. Um, and it's the same in other people, these victims. victim is Victimhood is just it's disgusting. And my own victimhood was disgusting. The I don't want to do this. I'm scared. I'm well, man. This is challenging. That's disgusting to me. It, and maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe I should be more compassionate. But I feel like I'm at war with it. And if I feel like I don't have that opinion or that uh, that veneer over it of war, I I give up too easily. In war, you can't give up. You're gonna die. I'm it's the same here. I'm going to die. Do I want to die fighting or do I want to die rolling over on my back crying? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that kind of came through that, that one diet I was telling you about, about screaming in the, in the forest. It's like, what am I going to do? I'm, huh? I'm going to give up on everything? I'm just going to roll over and die? 
I can cry all I want. Nobody's going to soothe me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's a, I think that's a really important distinction too, is I think maybe sometimes if people hear that, like this idea of victimhood is disgusting, that can be very triggering for mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. And it's, I think a really important distinction is not that what happened to you wasn't real no. or it didn't affect you. No. It's quite the opposite. It was real and it did affect you. Mm -hmm. But for me, the difference is, you know, even these things, they, we could say they served us, Mm -hmm. they, they protected us somehow. But at the end, if I keep feeding that, if I keep giving it power, if I don't stand up to it, if I don't try and overcome it, then I actually keep that alive, you know? And, Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the archetypical battle. That's the archetypical hero's journey is, yeah, the hobbit never had to leave his house. (laughs) He could have stayed there. He had a comfortable life. But he knew that there was something he had to overcome. Mm. And so, you know, again, it's not to say these things aren't important, because they are. No, yeah. But how, until I I develop the courage to overcome that, then that becomes my life. I am the abused person. I am the downtrodden person. I am the discriminated person. I I am this. And it's, it's again, building up those layers of, I am this, I am that. And, and it does, it takes a tremendous courage to look at that and say, this disgusts me because it always does. Mm -hmm. I think if we look at that deep down inside, we see that that's true for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, any of those things, they, they're disgusting. I mean, that's, I think that's even where the word victim comes from because we realize like it's gross. It's that happened to me. But how do I overcome that? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the fundamental things to see is actually just to see that we have to recognize that we have to, we have to name it. We have Mm -hmm. to, we have to see it with, you know, name and form to make it manifest so that then we can make a choice, you know, as you said, which is then to overcome it. And sometimes these things, they have to be very gross. They have to be very heavy because if they weren't just, okay, we'll just live with it. Leave it. it. Yeah. Yeah, Leave it. (laughs) You know, so it, I think it often has to come to that point mm-hmm. where it is very disgusting, where we realize, okay, I, I have to overcome this now. And, mm-hmm. and much as Sui said to you, only you can do that. <laughs> and I think that's part of the, the, the kind of that victim mentality too, is that, well, someone else needs to do that. It's someone else's responsibility. Mm-hmm. And yet I, at least in my work, I've never seen that happen. <laughs> You know, even as you said, you know, when, when Sui is singing to you or someone is singing to you, there's still my part. There's only so much someone can do. They mm. can bring those things up. They can try and take them out, move them back together. But it takes it takes a willingness. It still takes a, a courage for that individual to, to go into that. So Absolutely. Well, we often say to people, you know, this work is 50% you, 50% plants. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. Yeah. We can't we can't change anyone if they don't want to change, which is also an interesting thing with singing to people. Is man, you can come to us and say you want to be healed, but if inside you don't actually want to be healed, if you haven't come to that conclusion inside, we can't do anything. Mm-hmm. We can make again, we can make the outside look nice and shiny, but that's it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's so well said about victimhood. Um, it, it did become very ugly for me. It was very ugly. And I wanted someone else to do it for me. I was lazy. It was, it was a very powerless state. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes me think of Neo when the Morpheus asks him about fate. He says, do you believe in fate? And Neo says, no. He says, why? He says, uh, Neo says, because I, I don't. Because I don't want to believe that I'm not in control of my life. Mm. And I feel that victimhood can be a very fatalistic mentality. Again, it does not deny the facts that things have happened to you. But once we accept that, acknowledge that, and utilize that, that momentum, that fear, that fire, and push forward, you're ten times stronger than you were before. The scar becomes the new war badge. Um, so I don't want to like put down victims either. I don't want to, <laughs> but it's a, it's a really important point mm-hmm. is that, you know, 
you know, this work, it, it takes a courage and it takes a, a desire. And I think, as you also said, it takes, and it's also a very dirty word for a lot of us, it takes faith, mm-hmm. it takes a belief, it, it takes a, an internal desire. And that's something Leela was saying too, and I've heard many times, but, you know, you said it, this idea of sui, which is there's, for so many people, there's this noise that's in the way. Mm. And if that noise is there, there's only so much the plants can do. You know, if I don't want to believe that healing is possible or this is possible, I'm creating these walls and it's very difficult for something to penetrate that. Uh, You know, if I say the door is locked and I don't think I can unlock it. It's going to be locked forever (laughs) or for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Do you have a do you have a heart out at one o'clock? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, uh, if, so you're, you're, you're working with, with, uh, Safa here, mm-hmm. maybe do you want to just talk briefly about if people want to get in touch with you and how Absolutely. they can find you and yeah. w- what you do, what you offer? So our website is bodyofprana.com. Uh, Safa, who's my partner, she's been doing pranic healing for almost 16 years now. Uh, another tradition of energetic healing, which she's brought into the plant world and has been supported by Sui and her diets to keep flourishing there. Uh, so she's very, very skilled at that, very knowledgeable. Um, she offers personal pranic healing sessions with people, both long distance and uh, in home. Uh, we also offer ceremonies in our home. Uh, usually they're retreats. You have to sign up. We do a medical screening. Uh, and then we have you for anywhere from five ceremonies to seven ceremonies, uh, depending on how deep the, you want to go. Um, within that, it's just, it's very personalized work. Uh, you have the option or the opportunity to have things translated to you in your own language. Um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately right now we're kind of on pause as things are all closed, but when things open up, we are pretty available. So uh, we were fully booked this whole year until <laughs> COVID hit. Uh, and then that stopped everything. So we do have a, a schedule online. If you find some of those those places are open for you and you'd like to come down, please do. Um, on top of that, uh, Alan and I also have a podcast, which is mm. Beyond Words with Alan and Felix. If you want to check that out as well, uh, you're more than welcome to. Cool, brother. Well, I'll put all those links up on the uh, the show notes. Thank and, you, man. Uh, yeah. Hopefully we all get back to work sometime soon. <laughs> I hope so. I'm not one for idle hands. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate it. Same. Yeah. yeah thank yeah, you so much. You. Maybe we get Saf on uh, one of these days, too. Awesome. I'm sure yeah. she'd love to. Yeah. yeah. Cool, brother. Well, thank you. Thank you. So that's it, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, if you'd like to see the full version, uh, try checking out Patreon. Uh, it's a really good way to help to support this show, to give back. Um, and for as little as a dollar a month or uh, a dollar an episode even, uh, it really helps to keep the show going, to support me, to support the show, to support this work. Uh, so for anyone who has uh, donated or is a member of Patreon, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Um, if you aren't able to do that, uh, even just hitting the subscribe button through YouTube, and going on Apple Podcasts and leaving a starred rating and a review is a really big help in supporting this show. So uh, that's it. Thank you guys so much. Um, I think the next guest I have coming on Uh, I'm still not sure the exact order, uh, but hopefully I'm going to get my friend Marav on, who does a lot of work with tobacco. Uh, I might get um, Felix's partner, Safa, on to do a podcast. Uh, And I'm trying to get um, Leela, who was, I think, episode maybe six, uh, get her back on with her sister, Laura, who is also a curandera. So that should be a really good show. Um, and then also my friend Tanya, who uh, worked at the temple for a really long time, uh, and her partner, Romulo, who's a Shipibo Coranderdo, uh, who I have a lot of respect for, um, and he's a really great guy. So uh, I think we might do two separate podcasts with them, or maybe together, I'm still not sure, uh, but both of them are amazing people, really immersed in this work and, and have a lot of knowledge. So uh, there's some really good shows coming up. So that's it. Thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I will see you on the next episode.